Bonjour. Et merci. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. That is the extent of my French, I'm afraid. Um, but, uh, but I very much appreciate the invitation to come and speak today. Um, my talk will be on quantum computing for scientific discovery, specifically the methods, interfaces, and results that we anticipate from these types of systems. I am from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. This is a Department of Energy Research and Development Facility in the United States. Uh, what you can see here is an aerial view of the laboratory. The main part of the research occurs there in the center. Off to the upper left is the location of the spalu spalation neutron source, one of the brightest sources of neutrons in the world. Uh, just to the right is the high flux isotope uh, reactor where we make medical isotopes for global supply chain. And then, of course, our high performance computing facilities support all of this material science research. And that'll be the starting point today for my uh, conversation on how quantum computing can impact scientific discovery. Of course, Oak Ridge is home to Titan. It is currently number five on the top 500 list in high performance computing systems. It has about 27 petaflops peak performance. It, it consumes over uh, nine megawatts of power. It's about the size of a basketball stadium. We are currently replacing Titan with Summit. It is about 10 times uh, faster, at least in terms of floating point operations per second, and slightly a uh, little bit more power, close to 14 megawatts. We're hoping that this will achieve the number one status again, but even if it does not, the next question will always be, what comes after that system? At Oak Ridge, we're always planning for the future of computing. In the past, performance enhancements have relied on the reduction in feature size of our quantum processors. And you can see on the left here, as we've gone from continuum models for what the devices look like down to atomistic models, we're now reaching the point where we talk about a single atom transistor. And for me, the question is not whether or not Moore's law will end. There's the end of Moore's law right there. There's a single atom, a phosphorus atom, on the surface of a silicon substrate in between two leads. That is basically the smallest transistor we can ever hope to make. Now, how are we going to improve performance in the future? We can no longer decrease feature sizes. We've reached the ultimate limit there. And the census needs, seems to be that we need to adopt some new computational models. We need to come up with some new ideas that can improve our ability to solve problems, not just solve the problems faster. And of course, this is where the topic of quantum computing comes in. So what is quantum computing? Well, we've heard several different definitions today. I'll give you mine just to, to join the crowd. But it is essentially quantum mechanical computation. It's a model of computing in the sense that it allows us to take an input, uh, process that to generate an output, and that output can solve some problem in a meaningful way. But what makes it unique is that the quantum mechanics that we d use to describe this is not our familiar conventional description of classical mechanics. We have, for example, a model of the hydrogen atom. It's a point charge surrounded by another point charge. But the truth is that quantum mechanics says this system looks more like the experimental uh, data that we see right here, a diffuse cloud of probabilities for the electron's location. This model of computation means that we have to use probabilistic concepts to understand how the machine itself operates. Now, we're very fortunate because quantum mechanics has a well-defined theory. And in fact, the Schrodinger equation provides us with an understanding of how that probability distribution uh, actually behaves. It's given in terms of the wave function, psi of t. It evolves according to a partial differential equation. The generator for this motion is actually the Hamiltonian. This can be a time-dependent, externally defined quantity. And indeed, quantum computing is really about controlling this equation. It's about quantum control, and it's about defining a Hamiltonian that takes our quantum state from some time, t0, to another time, t1. Now, of course, a qubit is the fundamental concept within quantum computing. This is a three-dimensional representation. The north and the south poles of this sphere represent the conventional idea of a bit, 0 and 1. But a qubit can represent a superposition of those two possibilities. And so every point on the surface of this sphere is a, um, a possible value of a qubit. There's an infinite number of points on the surface of this sphere. Now, that's a theoretical concept for describing information. But in order to make a quantum computer, we have to be able to manipulate this representation of the information. So foremost, we have to have a system of many qubits. I'll refer to these as a register. 
These have to be well-defined so that we can address each one individually. We have to be able to initialize them to a specific starting state. We have to be able to operate on them with a universal set of gates. This universality condition says that I want to be able to transform my qubit from one state to any other possible state within the available Hilbert space. I also have to be able to do that transformation within a time scale that prevents the information from being lost. So decoherence is the interaction of my primary system, my qubit, with its surroundings. If my operations that I perform take much longer than the decoherence time, I've lost the computation. I refer to this ratio of the decoherence time to the operations as the duty cycle. This is to say, how many operations can I do within this window? I also have to be able to measure the qubits. This is how I perform readout. In more advanced architectures, I do need the ability to move qubits around. I also need the ability to swap their information between two register locations. Given that definition of what a quantum computer has to satisfy, what are the principles of its operation? Well, again, my claim is that this is really solving a partial differential equation. I have to provide some boundary conditions, so psi at t0. I have to provide the generator function, h of t. But if I were trying to model this classically, as we've just heard, I would be solving this equation using numerical methods. Quantum mechanics tries to solve this equation using the physical systems themselves. I prepare a register in a well-defined state. I apply a sequence of unitary operations, we often call these gates, onto that register. And then I perform my measurements. You can see here a diagram that emphasizes this time sequence. So starting on the left, my register is initialized to the all zero state. And as I move to the right, I apply these discrete operations until I perform my measurements. Some algorithms may require feedback. So the result of measurement may determine what the input state needs to be for the next version. And of course, we've heard about the difference between the computational models for realizing this. Here is an example of the circuit model, and we had a very nice discussion about the adiabatic model in the previous talk. Currently, there's a lot of development in realizing the principles of quantum computing, and this is what I call quantum processing units. Here's a gallery of a select few. Honestly, I've given up trying to update this slide. It's just changing far too fast. The, um, but this, the numbers are more or less the same. There are several different technologies that are being considered. Superconducting and trapped ion are very two prominent ones. But all of them have very small register sizes. So anywhere from one to 20 qubits, at least within the circuit model. Their one qubit gate fidelities have, uh, are on the order of three nines. Their two qubit gate fidelities on the order of two nines, so 99%. But there's limited connectivity and good addressability. So you can generally make the qubit you want to perform the operation. But this duty cycle, the ratio of the decoherence time to the operations, is still relatively small. It's on the, anywhere on the order from 100 up to 1,000. That's far too small for the types of algorithms that people have considered that may have on the order of millions of operations. So this limits the type of applications that we can perform. And ultimately, these limitations come back to the gate noise and the connectivity. The early vendors that are providing access, such as D-Wave and IBM, provide access to processors like this. So approximate quantum computing was the name for this in the previous talk. I just think it's noisy. But even then, trying to come up with use cases for noisy quantum computers is certainly possible. And I'll give you a few examples. But our interaction with these systems is still very loose. You use these systems the same way you use a website. You log in, you provide some data in a form, you press submit, that gets pushed to a server, it performs an operation and returns you back a result. Again, my motivation is to understand how quantum computing can impact high performance computing. And this is not how we perform high performance computing. Rather, high performance computing for scientific purposes is dominated by massively parallel processing systems. You can see here pictures of Titan and Summit you can also see the ranking of the top five systems in the world as of last November. Of course, the top system has nearly 100 petaflops, over a petabyte of memory available. This is the type of system that a quantum computer has to be competitive with. 
Now, admittedly, these systems are designed for solving very specific types of problems. They're largely designed for solving partial differential equations or linear algebra type systems. They are almost always making use of domain decomposition, so breaking a problem up into smaller pieces and operating on those pieces concurrently. However, they have met certain constraints in terms of power consumption and programming complexity that essentially imply that that path forward is coming to an end as well. And so the expectation is by the time we reach an exaflop system, which may be within the next five years, these constraints will be overwhelming and we'll need to turn to new technologies in order to overcome the system design challenges. So one approach is to consider a quantum accelerated high performance computing system. In this system, we actually have to figure out how to insert quantum computing into this modern scientific computing paradigm. And I'll give you some examples of this in a minute. But the one question that should be dominating this discussion, is this really worth it? Are QPUs compatible with the way that we do HPC? It's not obvious. It's not obvious that we can satisfy domain decomposition. It's not obvious that we can satisfy the interconnect requirements. It's not obvious that we can satisfy the power requirements or the programming complexity. So this is not an obvious answer to using quantum accelerators within HPC. Of course, the use cases for when we might do this need to be dominated by the algorithms. This is a co-design effort. My algorithms determine my use cases, my use cases determine my system design, my system design determines my performance. We know there are some very good algorithms for quantum computing in the theoretical model. Quantum simulation is obvious. Solving Schrodinger's equation is exactly what quantum computers do. Calculating partition functions, performing discrete optimization, training machine learning systems, all of these have also found mappings into the quantum computing paradigm. Within Oak Ridge National Laboratory, we see that there are several scientific disciplines where this has a clear overlap. High energy physics, material science, chemistry, even biological systems. But there are other less ob obvious overlaps in artificial intelligence, data analytics, planning and routing, even verification and validation of logical systems. So example, debugging code is a place where quantum computing may be able to make an impact. I'll just focus on one example today, computational chemistry. We heard some very nice results earlier from Peter um, on what IBM has doing in this, and I'll actually uh, show some of those results as well as our own. One of the first methods that came up for quantum chemistry was based on what's known as the phase estimation algorithm. It's an extremely powerful method. We can actually achieve an exponential speed up relative to full configuration interaction methods. That is to say that we can get very accurate very quickly using quantum computing. The way that this is done, of course, is we solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation. That turns out to be the application of a unitary operator from my system starting at time t0 up to the system at time t. But I can approximate that unitary as a sequence of unitary operators, a process known as trotterization. If I implement that trotterized product of operators onto my register, I can transform it according to a specific Hamiltonian, in fact, the Hamiltonian of the molecule that I'm interested in. That Hamiltonian then determines the energy structure of the quantum state that I've calculated, and by using the quantum Fourier transform, I can actually get out an estimate of the energy of the molecule represented by the Hamiltonian. I can perform this for different configurations of the Hamiltonian, and in that way I can trace out the potential energy surface that defines it. Unfortunately, phase estimation algorithm is extremely expensive. For the molecule shown here, which is nitrogenase, and it has a very interesting story that I'll be glad to tell later, calculating the electronic structure for this, this uh, system using this approach could either take on the order of 130 days using 111 logical qubits or using some tricks for parallelization, we could get it down to 110 hours using 1,982 qubits. Unfortunately, the duty cycle that our processors currently satisfy are nowhere near this time scale. The decoherence times are generally well under a few minutes oftentimes less than a second. So in order to adopt quantum chemistry to a paradigm which we can actually solve on today's processors, we have to redesign the algorithm. 
And this is what's been done using the variational quantum eigen solver. The variational eigen principle, which says that the minimization of our Hamiltonian, our expectation value for the Hamiltonian, so our energy with respect to a state psi, where that state psi is any state within my Hilbert space, guarantees that I'll find the ground state for that Hamiltonian. This is what's known as the variational principle in quantum chemistry. Now, I can generate a family of states parameterized by this variable theta that samples my Hilbert space for the possible set that may represent the ground state of my system. I then have to compute that state by applying a sequence of unitary operators, and then I have to search through that set. So as an algorithm goes, I have a register that I initialize to the all zero state. I have a unitary that represents state preparation. I apply that to the register. And then I have a Hamiltonian operator, H, which I want to estimate its value. I then perform a readout. I make an estimate of that energy. And then I, sat I ask whether or not it satisfied my threshold condition. Is my energy low enough? If it's not, then I continue my search. I feed back the value theta into my state preparation scheme. This gives me a new sequence of operators. I prepare a different state, and I again estimate the value of the energy. When I finally get an energy that I believe has reached the minimum, then the algorithm is complete, and I've found the lowest eigenstate. Now here are some examples that the IBM team have reported in Nature last year for three different molecules. On the left, you can see the H2 molecule. There's a very good agreement between the samples that were observed using this VQE algorithm and the actual potential energy surface of the molecule. But as you go to larger molecules, it turns out that there are actually errors due to the basis set. So this is just a conventional chemistry problem. I didn't use a large enough basis set to solve my problem. And that's why these potential energy curves don't exactly match the experimental data. Now, this has all been very serial and sequential. If I want to actually adapt this type of method to a high-performance computing system, I need to figure out how to parallelize it. I need to ask, is there even a way to parallelize this particular algorithm? And so at Oak Ridge, we figured out there are at least two. The first is to say that I actually have multiple terms in my estimate of the Hamiltonian. And the way I'm going to estimate it then is to partition up those terms and solve each one concurrently. Then I combine those terms together, give it an estimate for the energy, and I ask my question of whether or not it's met threshold. If it's not, then I have to update that parameter, again prepare a new state, and perform the same estimate. But you'll notice here I actually have three processors running in parallel, so there's a communication cost. There's a communication of transferring that parameter each of these uh, QPUs, and there's a communication of transferring the results back to some master controller that performs the threshold comparison. An alternative approach is to actually solve, uh, to decompose the search pace itself. And so now each QPU, uh, each QPU will search some part of the Hilbert space. And I'll decompose my problem in that direction. It turns out that both of these approaches can give you the same result. However, which one is faster depends a lot on the interconnect that is transferring the information between the QPUs as well as the size of the search space. So the macro architecture of the quantum accelerated HPC system is what makes a big difference here. So there is, of course, the version that we use now where there is some shared memory machine, for example, your laptop, and there is an interconnect between your laptop and some cloud-based quantum computing system. Perhaps it's a D-Wave, perhaps it's the IBM quantum experience. You access that by pushing the program over, the QPU operates, and it sends back the result. For the domain decomposition that we're talking about, we actually want to have multiple nodes, each with their own QPU, accepting instructions from their program to perform an operation and then communicate with each other. So this is what an MPI is known as a reduce all. So that data from every node goes back to a central location for comparison. This method is very powerful, as we've talked about, in terms of getting classical parallelization approach. But it does not allow for my QPUs to be entangled with each other. So in a sense, I have three distinct Hilbert spaces represented in this diagram, one at each node. 
An architecture which gets over that challenge is to have a quantum interconnect that allows my QPUs to communicate with each other. This is essentially allowing for me to use teleportation or entanglement swapping to um, entangle the registers within individual QPUs. But this comes at a cost. I now have to have very strong synchronization between the operations at multiple sites. So my classical interconnect has to be able to keep up with the operations occurring on my QPU. And at the same time, there's more data to transfer. Here's an example using the second architecture, what I'll call the conventional accelerator approach, to do parallelized quantum processing of the H2O molecule. So again, this is using VQE, uh, a limited basis size, and it took about 14 qubits to approximate. There's over 1,086 terms that have to be estimated, and this is over 28 parameters in that variable theta. You can see here the convergence takes over uh, almost 1,200 iterations to get down to an energy that's close to the ground state uh, for the equilibrium configuration of, uh, of, wa of water. However, the way that we've done this is to deep, uh, partition that problem up across multiple QPUs. So for this experiment, we're actually using a numerical simulator to calculate what happens for each QPU and then a reduce all command to combine that data back together. But you can see here the black line demonstrating the strong scaling. So for this fixed problem size, as we increase the number of QPUs, we get an exponential decrease in the amount of time that it takes. So we go all the way from 10 seconds down to, um, I'm sorry, from 100 seconds down to almost one. This model of quantum accelerated HPC seems to have some use cases that may match the near-term possibilities, but we need to come up with a better understanding of how it actually operates. Here's a description of what I think a quantum accelerator node actually looks like. Of course, there's a CPU, a memory system, maybe even a GPU, and a network interface. But then I have a CPU which is further decomposed into its components, a control unit, an execution unit, and a register. The control unit is what issues instructions, essentially the, um, the discrete operations that I wanna have applied to my register. The register, on the other hand, is what issues analog signals. It's what defines H of T and controls the state of the register. Of course, I can perform readout as well. In that case, the register emits its own analog signal, which is translated into a discrete digitized form and then processed by the QCU. Here's a rough example of how that model maps onto the existing technology. This is a picture off of the internet about the IBM Q system. Of course, this looks very much like an experimental system in a laboratory, but it satisfies all of the same design requirements. There's a control unit that actually issues what is the gate sequences that need to be executed. There is an execution unit which performs arbitrary waveform generation and has signal generators to output RF pulses. And then of course, there's the register located down at the bottom of the cryostat. Now, it's difficult to say, is this an experiment or is this a computer? I think we're at a point in time with quantum computing where those two are exactly the same thing. But in the future, we can imagine evolving this type of design into something that looks more like a conventional uh, uh, computing node. Now, the execution model for our quantum accelerator is fairly straightforward. We have a CPU that is gonna issue instructions through a memory system that transforms over to the QPU where the control unit is the interface. It parses those instructions issues out what I'll call its operands or op codes to the QEU, who then applies the fields and collects the return. And that works its way back up. But I will call out the memory system. This is an important part of ensuring that the information from one component makes it to the other. The speed at which we're able to transfer that information has a huge impact on performance because again, we're limited by the duty cycle in the operation of our devices. This particular component design leads to a hierarchy of languages. I won't have time to go through each layer, but you can start to see a familiar separation of concerns within the design of this system according to the specification of the instructions, the signals, and the programming. Given that model for executing quantum programs, we're then left with the question of how does the system operate? And at the moment, I'll claim that there's not really any good definition of an operating system for a quantum computer. We don't even really understand the runtime environment. 
Most of the times we're operating with these systems, we're using some kind of interactive module, a web interface, a Python programming script, Jupyter notebooks are very popular. But in truth, we need to have something more sophisticated, more automated, and more tightly integrated. We need application frameworks that allow us to access system libraries, which then use an OS and a scheduler to actually issue these instructions over to the devices. Now, unfortunately, we can't define OS for every device that's available, and so some hardware abstraction layer or virtual machine is likely to be necessary in order to ensure compatibility across technologies. However, the development of this runtime system is not as simple as taking your favorite Linux kernel and adding some new module in order to access a new device. There are some real-time programming constraints in terms of the operation of the system, especially if we anticipate being able to uh, respond to measurement feedback. At Oak Ridge, we're also working on a programming framework that allows us to basically control this hybrid computational model. It's called XACC. It's located on github.com. It allows us to write mixed language programs. So I can have something that mixes together C, C++, and my favorite domain-specific quantum programming language. Those all go in the same source code. There is a keyword directive that identifies which parts are quantum and which parts are classical. We then use the LLVM compiler framework to offload these different parts to the appropriate tool chain. For example, if I have a C++ program using the scaffold programming language, trying to compile down to an open chasm representation to target the IBM QPU, then my LLVM compiler will actually notice where the open chasm kernel is located and then hand that off to the appropriate Qiskit toolchain. This all generates an intermediate representation which we then want to have access to and which I think the community needs to have access to in order to perform transformations that allow us to target performance and tune behavior on specific devices. Here's an example of how this looks in practice. On the right, you see the actual source code for performing a very simple computational chemistry calculation. We declare the accelerator that we want to have as part of our system to be the IBM. We create a buffer. This is, again, part of the memory system that's going to store and transfer results. We have a kernel source code structure, which is actually identified by this QPU keyword. This will, at the moment, it holds nothing, but for a practical example, would have your actual programming statements. We then build that program and execute it. On the left, you'll actually see the picture that this corresponds to. So after I've compiled this program, I have an object code that runs on the host system. It performs whatever instructions it's been told to do, including passing off control to the associated uh, accelerator or quantum processing unit. So again, the main memory system is, re is responsible for mitigate, uh, managing that handoff and also responsible for receiving the results and handing it back. <laughs> because we don't yet have operating systems that adhere to these types of requirements, we're currently using discrete event simulators to monitor the performance of these types of systems. In particular, we're looking at the structural simulation toolkit, which has been used before in analyzing uh, acceler quantum, uh, sorry, ex uh, GPU accelerators for node architectures. And we think that this is a valuable way to get an understanding of the communication and dependency requirements going on within these systems. As a first example, we looked at the energy requirements that it would take to perform Grover's search in a simple problem. As a reminder, Grover search is if I've given an unstructured database, I want to check whether or not a specific item is located within it. We know that brute force is the best classical approach to this, and on worst case, takes n over two queries, or average case. The quantum search method, which we've heard about before today, can require only square root of n queries in order to perform this same search. To, to give you more of a practical example, and this I think was more um, important in days gone by, if someone calls you on the phone and you don't recognize the phone number, you could get the phone book and try to figure out what their name is. But that's almost an impossibly hard task because the phone book is organized alphabetically. So relative to the phone numbers, it's unstructured. It turns out that this same uh, uh, type of search also is what underlies Bitcoin mining. So there may be a more practical example and more modern one. I've been told to emphasize that we do not do Bitcoin mining at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The, um, 
The particular technology that we wanted to estimate the cost war for is a silicon quantum computer model that has been put forth by the, uh, the UNSW group. This model is actually based on the flip-flop architecture. You can see a picture here in which a superconducting resonator is used to um, enable long-range uh, coupling between qubits uh, based on dipole-dipole interactions. It turns out that that's not even really the most important part in this architecture because the most important part is the thing that is energy limiting, and that's the measurements. These are based on a single electron transistor that typically require five attojoules to perform those measurements and as much as 100 microseconds. By comparison, the unitary operations themselves take on the order of four zeptojoules, so almost a thousand times smaller in terms of energy. For our architecture, we've actually designed a very complex system in which there is a hierarchy of CPU cores, L1 and L2 cache, a memory controller, as well as a quantum processor, uh, according to the quantum control unit and execution unit I was talking about, uh, connected to its own L1, L2 cache. For the purposes of this demonstration, we're gonna throw away that memory system. So I'm not gonna track the cost of the memory systems for the quantum example, I'm just gonna tell you that the CPU is actually transferring these instructions directly to the QPU, and we're gonna avoid how they actually got there. As a conventional computing baseline, we've actually compared this brute force search, where we look at the assembly code and figure out how much uh, energy each instruction in the assembly code, code itself takes, and then given that we have to do n over two loops on average, we're able to compute the amount of energy it requires. We use the Intel Core i7 as reference. Uh, we also use a, um, an average uh, amount of energy uh, per bit for the DRAM reads, which is a, turns out to be a significant part of this calculation. So here's an example of this type of calculation that we're able to perform using a model of our high-performance computing system. At the bottom, you can see the database size in terms of bits. So the number of items in my database grows exponential to this. So two to the end is the number of items. Uh, for reference, two to the 128 is the largest size that we considered. This is equivalent to all the IPv6 uh, possible internet addresses. On the left axis, the Y axis, is the log of the energy, uh, but it's shown in absolute units, and this is measured in terms of joules. You'll notice that there are two sets of curves. The ones at the bottom represent the quantum computing technology. This is the minimum energy required to execute Grover's algorithm using uh, implementation of the Oracle, as well as one and two layers of quantum error correction. You'll see here that it grows rather linearly with the amount, uh, with the size of the system, and this is entirely what we expect. It takes on the order of 10 megajoules to solve search for the largest system shown here. But the top two lines represent the conventional computing system. The first one, the lower one, is without the inclusion of the memory reads. So this is just the processor performing brute force search and the amount of energy it takes to do that. Whereas the top line is the addition of the memory fetch. And you can see that's a substantial component. What I would call out is the dash line that separates the two as when you get further out. This corresponds to the total amount of energy that the world puts out per year. So performing this problem on a quantum computer is not the equivalent of doing it faster or more accurately. It's the question of whether you can do it or not at all. In fact, performing this calculation on a conventional computing system consumes more energy than we currently have available. So at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, we're focused on three specific topics in terms of quantum computing. The first is the physical sciences. This is the one that we think is most near term because it most easily maps over into the Schrodinger equation. As was pointed out earlier, quantum computers solve the Schrodinger equation. Finding problems that map directly into that paradigm is essential. In the middle is the applied sciences. So this is engineering, uh, energy, and medicine. These are places where solving computational problems related to the Schrodinger equation may have immediate impacts. So for example, in medicine, if I can understand the electronic structure of a molecule better, I may be able to do a better drug design. But on the right, we include the data sciences, which are things such as machine learning and artificial intelligence. These problems have the, the feature that they require a lot of input. They're often inference problems. I'm searching for a pattern or some kind of uh, reconstruction about what actually happened. 
This seems to be a very promising area as well, but it almost certainly requires much larger systems than we anticipate to have in the near term. So given these three problem sets, we're currently focused on the idea of translational research. At Oak Ridge, we have a wide portfolio of research problems. My position is that all of them could use quantum computing. But to be able to actually demonstrate that requires an understanding of that problem, an understanding of the current best methods, and then a translation of that problem into some quantum algorithm that we understand as well. This is not easy. It requires collaboration between domain experts as well as quantum computing experts. So we focus on building those collaborations within the institute as well as with external stakeholders, people who have the same problem. Maybe it's not represented at Oak Ridge, but we have the same mechanism for figuring that out. And then finally, perhaps the most important thing is training the workforce for the future. If we think that within five years, quantum computing will achieve some threshold, some advantage over conventional computing, and it will become widely adopted, then having a workforce that actually understands the principles of operation, the basic requirements of quantum computers, and how to perform translational research will be incredibly important to take advantage of those systems. Right now, there's no clear path to building that type of infrastructure. As, we know, as was noted in the last talk as well, user communities are essential right now. Bringing together all of these disparate people, not just developers, but also the end users, to give feedback on what it is that's actually expected of quantum computing systems and what it is that they can actually do is going to be necessary in order to get over these technical challenges. So at Oak Ridge, we're doing this by providing access to a wide variety of different systems. The, um, I'll go quickly go through some of them before I run out of time. Of course, the D-Wave system we had a very nice description of. This has an enormous advantage over some of the existing processors. First off, its productization is relatively mature. It has a very strong support team. It has a very well-defined API. If I want to develop applications for this, I generally have very strong infrastructure to do that. However, it is, a very, um, uh, it is still a very experimental technology. It's still uh, having features added to it. It's still growing in terms of its capacity. And there still aren't very many of them available. At Oak Ridge, we're actually using a cloud-based subscription to be able to provide our users access, at least to the programming part. The IBM quantum processor is in a similar situation. It's also an experimental technology located in an actual laboratory where they're performing tweaks almost every day, trying to make it better. It still has ways to go to become as sophisticated as being able to be installed at another location. But the effort that has been put into exposing the API and the programming infrastructure gives us a lot of opportunity to start developing applications now. Using those against the actual um, hardware is, of course, uh, the ideal. But using those against numerical simulators as well gives us an advantage to understand how we think performance might behave once we meet certain uh, uh, device requirements. As a slight uh, tangent on this, I would note that Oak Ridge is actually part of the recently announced IBM Q network. This is a... Um, and when it was announced, uh, 12 institutions around the world that are providing access to the IBM processor as it grows to its larger sizes. Oak Ridge anticipates uh, being part of this, and as far as I know at the moment, is the only research node located in North America. And of course, there's Atos and the quantum learning machine, which we've had an enormous uh, experience with. We are largely using this for numerical simulation, uh, for verification and validation of quantum circuits. Honestly, it's extremely useful for testing out whether or not our programs are actually correct. It makes no sense to write a program, send it over to a noisy device, and get back a noisy result, and not have any way of checking whether or not it was actually the device or the program that caused that result. The, the Atos quantum learning machine actually gives us an ability to do that. But what I find even more interesting here is the, the programming interface. It actually starts to address the question of the operating system, the scheduling, the constraint optimization, uh, in a way that looks like a modern scientific uh, computing uh, accelerator. And this is certainly something that we want to see grow in the future. Coming back to the user community, there's multiple concerns here. Certainly the end users, the stakeholders, they want to know about performance. How fast did it run? What was the energy it took? Is it better than what I have right now? But in order to answer those questions, we have to understand every layer within the stack. 
all the way from the materials up to the applications themselves. So coming up with some kind of terminology, some standardization of these interfaces will be important going forward. For that purpose at Oak Ridge, we're collaborating with the Eclipse Foundation to develop a working group focused on quantum computing software. You can access our initial meeting notes located at the web address here. And if you wanna join, please feel free to send us an email. We're more than happy to include everybody that's available. In addition, at Oak Ridge, we also publish a weekly newsletter known as the QCI News. This is just to keep our community up to date, to let them know about the latest events that have happened that week, to communicate conference announcements, funding opportunities, and job uh, postings. So with that, let me conclude. Thank you for the opportunity again to visit you and to talk today, and I look forward to working with all of you in the future. Merci notre orateur. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions dans la salle Non, oui, toujours. Uh, you mentioned uh, high energy physics. What are some of the applications concerned? Uh, considered, sorry. So as it turns out, my backup slide might actually help to this. <laughs> This is actually low energy physics. Um, for high energy physics, we're actually looking at uh, lattice QCD models. Um, we recently had a paper come out uh, mapping the Schwinger model over into a quantum computing system. I'll have to defer you to the paper itself. That's not one I had a direct experience with. This particular problem is actually calculating the nuclear binding energy uh, for the deuteron uh, isotope. The, um, of course, that's a quantum mini body problem as you scale it up. It turns out you can use the exact same uh, variational quantum eigensolver approach in, the, in this problem as well. So, um, so what, I guess, to give you a, a bigger answer, the, um, the types of methods that seem to be showing up in, say, chemistry domains actually seem to be porting over to the other domains as well. Thank you. D'autres questions? Nous remercions notre thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um,